Hello and welcome to the Organizational Leadership Series. The General Counsel is Innovative Leader and our guest today is Elizabeth D. Moore. This program is brought to you by the Ruben Mark Initiative for Organizational Character and Leadership. I'm Avery Katz and I'm the Ruben Mark Professor of Organizational Character at Columbia Law School. Also with, also with us today and hosting the meeting is Mary Harrington, the Director of the Mark Initiative at the Law School. Mark Initiative is a joint initiative between Columbia Law School and Columbia Business School, exploring lifelong leadership lessons and exceptional or organizational character and culture. At the law school, its focus is the in-house counsel program, which consists of academic courses and programming on the role of in-house counsel and executive leadership by lawyers. Today, we have a particularly distinguished leader as our speaker, whose career exemplifies the leadership and character central to the Mark Initiative's mission. Elizabeth D. Moore is the retired senior vice president and general counsel of Consolidated Edison, where she also served on the boards of its two subsidiaries, Con Edison's Clean Energy Businesses and Con Edison Transmission. At Con Edison, Ms. Moore advised the company's chairman and CEO as a member of the company's corporate leadership team. She was responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the approximately 80 attorney, 200 employee law department, including litigation, reg services, corporate secretary, and business ethics and compliance groups. Prior to joining Con Edison, Ms. Moore was a partner at Nixon Peabody LLP, and before that served in the administration of New York Governor Mario Cuomo for 12 years, culminating as counsel to the governor. Ms. Moore earned a law degree from St. John's University and holds a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. She served on Cornell's Board of Trustees for 14 years, and in 2013 was elected trustee emeritus. She received that board's highest recognition when elected presidential counselor and receiving the Frank H.T. Rhodes Exemplary Alumni Service Award. Ms. Moore has been named one of the most powerful women in corporate America by Black Enterprise and has received numerous accolades, including the Ida B. Wells Barnett Justice Award from the New York County Lawyers Association and the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Ms. Moore will be in conversation today with our moderator, Petal Modest, our Associate Dean for Student Affairs Administration, who oversees the operations of student-facing offices at Columbia Law School, including career services, graduate legal studies, registration services, social justice initiatives, student services, and the Executive LLM program. And I'm now happy to turn the mic over to Dean Modest. Thank you very much, Avery, and uh, welcome to all of you. Liz, welcome. Uh, just before we launch into the conversation itself, I wanted to let everyone know that we will do our best to leave some time at the end uh, for questions. Uh, but uh, now it's time to talk. So here we go. So Liz, I would like to start um, by talking a little bit about your early life. Um, and my first question is, your parents are Barbadian, so it's nice to have another person of West Indian <laughs> background in the audience with us today. Um, but you were born and raised in Queens, New York. Which adult in your early life had the most profound influence on you and why? Oh, so which adult? Um, um, one is fictional and one is real. The okay. real one is my dad. Okay. Uh, my father was your, uh, a, a, a very traditional Caribbean uh, adult, um, but he was also very um, um, supportive of his daughter's desire to be a lawyer, um, to be whatever I wanted to be, um, to play sports. Um, I was pretty a, a, a fair a, a tomboy, and my dad would buy baseball bats, softball gloves, golf court clubs. So uh, he was incredibly supportive of, of my desire to uh, ultimately to be a lawyer. The fictional person, um, the first lawyer I ever got to know, and um, probably many of the, the folks on, the, on, the, on this uh, webinar may not know this person, is Perry Mason. Mm -hmm. um, Perry Mason TV show uh, back in the day. Um, Perry Mason was a lawyer and what was terrific about him, what I found fascinating is he would put a witness on the stand and within you know, 10 questions, um, the witness would, would confess. Um, I, I just, it was my first exposure to you know, a, a lawyer of any kind. And yes, he was a fictional lawyer, but he really, um, that really uh, influenced some of my thinking about becoming an attorney. Um, the first real lawyer, real black woman lawyer I ever saw was Barbara Jordan. 
-hmm. And she was my absolute hero. I mean, there was this wonderful Congresswoman with a deep voice, um, completely in control. Um, I just found her to be totally amazing. Mm -hmm. So in addition to Perry Mason and Barbara Jordan and your dad uh, and some of the experiences you had um, with them, were there any other particular experiences? It sounds like you wanted to be a lawyer from, from quite an early age. Um, but if you take us through a little later on in your life, perhaps college or, or postgraduate uh, work, um, when you were clearly set that you're going to law school and this is what I want to do as a lawyer. Do you remember having that thought? And if so, what spurred it? Um, I, I, I um, applied and got into Cornell University School of Industrial Labor Relations, which is a state school. So uh, the tuition was much less than Cornell University, the liberal arts school, but you wound up uh, being, you know, going to school with uh, just Cornellians. We were Cornellians. Um, and I was you know, really encouraged in that program uh, to, to continue to pursue um, my a legal career. Uh, I was able to take pre-law classes and really was very excited and very interested in them. Um, and ultimately, frankly, when I graduated from law school, I didn't think my, I or my family could afford, from, from college, I or my family could afford to go to law school. So I told my father, I was gonna work for a few years and, um, and then perhaps go to law school at that point. And he said, absolutely not. He said, I will scrub floors. Yep. Um, I will do whatever it takes. Um, I was fortunate. I um, applied to a number of law schools, but St. John's gave me a full tuition scholarship, including books. Yeah. Um, and that's really what made it possible for me to go to law school as I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about some of the work you've done, which Avery uh, quite uh, uh, gave us a lot of wonderful detail about. I've been around for a while. <laughs> Would you describe for us um, a particularly challenging time? Could have been a crisis um, where you, you know, you were in your role as counsel um, to Governor Cuomo, perhaps uh, when you were serving as a law firm partner or at. GC, uh, at Conrad, sorry, as a GC. You know, you were serving as an advisor, a partner, maybe devil's advocate uh, sometimes. In addition to your subject matter expertise, what character traits would you say served you best in playing all of those roles so extraordinarily well? And how did you cultivate those traits? Well, I thank you, Pedal, for the extraordinarily well. Um, <laughs> at, at the time, I, it wasn't necessarily uh, that clear to me. And I guess the, the most challenging things that I faced as general counsel at Con Edison is when there was a loss of life, um, whether it was a member of the workforce or whether it was a member of the public. Uh, those are obviously horrible, horrible situations. And, um, and even if it wasn't um, necessarily, you know, the company's responsibility. In other words, somebody did something to, uh, to cause the, 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 uh, the, the injury or the, or the, the, the death. Um, it's still very, very difficult because you're dealing with a company that's in mourning to some extent. You're dealing with a, you know, a huge number of, of agencies, um, regulators, agencies, um, in, uh, in uh, we had an East Harlem gas explosion and I had the National Transportation Safety Board. Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember them from the Scully movie. Well, they're also responsible for pipeline safety. And it was one of the first times that that, that board, um, the federal board got involved in an investigation of, of a utility incident. Um, so navigating um, how to handle those kinds of investigations um, you know, making sure that they were done fairly, honestly, that we were we were transparent about as much as possible, and that we learned from those from those incidents, and um, and changed procedures or practices as necessary to ensure that they didn't happen in the future. One of Con Ed's um, major, um, not, probably the the most important thing is safety, um, mm -hmm. safety for the workforce. You're dealing with dangerous commodities. Safety for the members of the public that you are exposing to those dangerous commodities. So. I think um, 
um, the great thing about the culture of Khan Ed, and it was also true of the uh, Cuomo administration, is that it was collaborative. It was a teamwork. The, the, the people who reported to the governor, the people who reported to the chairman CEO of Con Edison, we each had a role. I was the general counsel. We had the financial. We had the communications person. We had government relations. Um, and we worked together as a team and as a collaborative process to, to, to advise not just the chairman CEO of the company, but the board as well, because obviously they're very, very concerned when these things uh, are occurring and when these things are happening. So I think um, I am a incredibly collaborative person. I respect the expertise of others. I am, um, I don't, I tend not to be, um, you know, I don't need to be the front person. Um, and uh, I think those traits really uh, served me well. Um, you know, I can be a, a assertive when I need to be, Right. But I think I'm also really very good about uh, listening and understanding that, that, you know, I don't know everything. There's people yeah. out there who know more than I do and to find those people and give them the opportunity to do what they do. Mm -hmm. Seems you also uh, were quite transparent as well. That seemed to be a, another uh, leading character trait that came up even in um, some of the instances you described. Absolutely. Um, so how did you hone those? character traits though, Liz. I, I wanna go back to that because I think that for our students, and look, many of them are already very collaborative. They're here in law school, they're here in business school, um, they have to work with other people. Um, but to be a really good listener, to be truly transparent and to be truly collaborative, um, it's not necessarily something that comes naturally to everyone. So are there things that you can advise uh, or future leaders um, in terms of how to make use of where they are now to hone those skills? Well, I, you know, I, I had terrific mentors in my career um, and received a lot of feedback um, throughout my career. And some of that feedback was actually professional assessments. Um, I've been assessed as much as, much as anybody. Um, but it was also feedback and willingness to hear, not just from people um, above me, but also my peers and my subordinates in many cases. So, so I really sought feedback. You know, I think there's the old slogan, feedback is a gift. I really felt that that was true. And, um, and there were times when people would pull my coat tail, my shirt tail and say, Liz, you know, you're, you're, you're out of control here. You are, you're, you're really getting into, uh, you're, you know, listen to this individual. Don't, don't just get all upset and angry and, you know, you, you can do that. Yeah. So um, I think um, that would, that's one way. The other thing I would say is the organizations that I worked with um, and whether it was the Cuomo administration, law firm, uh, Con Edison, um, they were open and transparent. That was encouraged by the governor, Governor Cuomo. That was encouraged by the chairman CEO. And I worked for two chairman CEOs at Con Edison. Um, so that was, I think the, the organization feeds that as well and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and really values that, rewards that. And I think that also makes it, makes it important to, to understand. Mm -hmm. So you talked a little bit about how difficult it was obviously to deal with, with death, um, with respect to, to, you know, being at Con Edison, uh, and having either employees or, or just people, uh, you know, pass away as, as a result or related to, to the work of Con Ed. Um, I'd like you to think a little bit about a time when you might have failed uh, professionally, which, which I think for most of us is something that's difficult, uh, and ask you to tell us how you actually leveraged that failure or the lessons you learned from it um, to move on to more significant accomplishments or achievements. Uh, well, 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 first of all, I, I don't, I want to make it clear, Conet didn't go around killing people. Yeah. Those are very, very rare circumstances. Sure. And, um, and oftentimes it was not necessarily the company's fault. Um, it right. was, you know, other folks. So, so just to be clear, this was, not noted. A, <laughs> this was not a common occurrence. Um, in terms of, in terms of failure, um, I suppose when I could not um, accomplish what my client, in some cases at the law firm, mm -hmm. or my boss, um, whether it was Governor Cuomo or the Chairman CEO of Con Edison, um, I think when you when you when you can't accomplish or get to where you they would like you to get to, 
I think that's um, that's always um, a problem. I suppose the, the, the probably the one that strikes me the most was uh, Governor Cuomo. It was a ad, ad, a, a um, strong opponent of the death penalty, and in his last year, in his last term, um, there was a situation where an individual um, should have been extradited to Oklahoma, which had a death penalty, and the governor knew that if we sent this individual to Oklahoma. Um, he would be sent to, he would, he would be given the death penalty. Um, so uh, we, uh, as lawyers, fought very, very hard to avoid having to send this individual to, um, to Oklahoma. Um, the governor lost the election, and the next governor who came in, Governor Pataki, immediately sent this individual to Oklahoma where he was executed. Um, I, you know, I, that was, that was a tough loss. It was a, a tough battle. Um, um, and I truly respected the governor for holding up to what he had expressed during his entire uh, te te tenure as, as governor. It wasn't necessarily a popular um, um, thing for him to hold to, um, but it was important to him and it was important to all of us who worked for him. So that I think was a, was a real um, disappointment. And how did it help you as you continue to advance in your career? What did you take from that experience? Well, you have to get up, brush yourself off and, and, you know, and um, learn from your, you know, what you might've done better or learn from what you might've done differently, but you can't dwell on this. Um, you know, you have to move on. You have to um, use whatever and, and, you know, Failing is, is sometimes more important than succeeding in terms of learning and growing and, um, and understanding. So I think um, you, you really have to, 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 do, to use it, Learn, lessons learned. And you know, one of the things that Con Edison spends a lot of time is le on lessons learned, on anything that goes wrong. Right. What did we do wrong? What did we do right? What could we do better? Uh, where were the pinch points? Where were the pain points? Um, you know, obviously a very essential and important service to uh, the city of New York and surrounding counties. So um, vital service, not just important, essential vital service. So you have to, you have to sort of, you're not going to do everything perfectly, but you have to figure out when you don't do things perfectly, how you can do sure. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's, that's wonderful advice. Now, one focus of the Ruben Mark Initiative, as you know, is organizational character. How do you define an organization's character? Is that the same as its culture? Yeah, I think character might, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I think character might be a shorthand for culture, um, um, because I think the culture, to me, defines the character, um, and uh, I think uh, culture is probably one of the most difficult things to understand, to change, if it needs to be changed. Um, because it involves top down and bottom up, um, you know, the top of the company can change in terms of what, what it thinks and what it's doing. But if you don't get that down to, you know, mm -hmm. the, the woman on the street, who's uh, going down in the manhole person hole, um, <laughs> um, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not going to take. And, you know, nowadays, I think the national association of corporate directors has made it very, very clear that culture should be a, a driving you know, thinking uh, influence a, a driving um, concern of boards of directors and senior level management. Mm -hmm. I mean, culture, culture, you know, transparency, integrity, inclusiveness, um, um, uh, environmental friendliness, sensitivity, um, all of those things and more um, come out of a company's culture, the ability for individuals who enter that organization to achieve all that they, their full potential. Um, it, and it is so hard and there's a big culture of a company and then there are mini cultures, right? There are many areas and how do you, how do you in a large company, how do you ensure that everybody's on the same page? Hmm. So you have said to me before um, when we were preparing for this, that culture to you is the most critical component of any organization. When you first got to Con Ed, um, do you remember if there was any facet of its culture that you found challenging? And during your time there in your role as GC, how did you eliminate, alleviate uh, that challenging facet of its culture? Well, the, um, I think the, the 
and this was not just me, this was the entire company was realizing mm -hmm. that customer is most important and and the way customers are interacting with lots of different businesses. You know, if you look at an Amazon um, as um, you know the, the, the online interaction that customers are having with lots of different businesses, um, the Con Ed interaction with customers was not what it should have been. And obviously the customer is our most important individual. So um, to, 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 to focus on the customer experience um, which meant that you're not referring to customers as you know, the load, <laughs> but referring to them as individuals, understanding that we're in the most diverse city in, in the country. And therefore we had to understand the different communities that we served. Um, and that was true of the law department as well. When I joined the law department, um, it, I, in my view, um, I had a, a lot of uh, retirement and eligible um, attorneys and, and, and the team. Um, these were incredibly experienced folks. They were really terrific attorneys, um, but we also didn't have a lot of diversity. Um, and so as those attorneys were and, and staff were leaving, um, I was able to really focus on recruiting a diverse uh, group of folks. And, and, and I use diversity in, a, in, a, in every way. Um, uh, we hired experienced individuals. We hired uh, people from different industries from law firms, from government. Um, and I thought it really made a huge difference. Um, and then the next thing, once you bring individuals in, how do you ensure that they have the opportunity to, to grow, to get that knowledge transfer, and also to, um, to, 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 to say that there are things that they did in their prior lives that maybe we should think about doing at Con Edison. So you have a, you know, once you have a very ingrained group of uh, individuals who've been there a long time. Sometimes innovation, introduction to technology is not as, uh, um, not as, as, much, as ingrained as it could be. So we had to give, you know, I really spent a lot of time trying to give people who joined the department room to talk about their experiences and to make suggestions and recommendations about how we could do things better from their perspective. Um, so, you know, you just mentioned that inclusiveness um, and, and diversity in all of its forms are, of course, integral to a, an organization's culture. And in a recent Harvard Business Review article titled, Why Do Boards Have So Few Black Directors? Uh, we were reminded that in just 2019, just last year, only, um, you know, something like 37% of S&P 500 firms did not have a single black board member. Um, something like only 4.1% of the Russell 3000 firms um, had black directors. And we know that those statistics are, are similarly dismal for other people of color, indigenous people, people with disabilities, et cetera. And so, you know, we are in such a different time in our world right now. The US is experiencing a major reckoning with, with systemic racism. And actually it's not just the US, it's, it's all over the world. Um, we are expected in the US to become a, majority minority uh, sort of country in about 15 years or so. And also um, boards that are sort of homogeneous have been shown to be um, very risk intolerant to lack risk oversight because everyone thinks about risk the same way and may, may miss things. And, and organizations with such boards have struggled to attract and retain uh, you know, diverse um, employees. So, Given all of these facts, how would you advise professionals of color who are in our audience today? Uh, and I have three questions to ask you, so I'll start with the first one. How would you advise them to respond to requests that they may have from their organizations uh, in the future to sit on diversity committees or lead diversity and inclusion efforts at their organizations? Well, I chaired the diversity committee at the law firm for many, many years. I was the first, um, the only black partner at that law firm at the time. And I also chaired the, uh, the, the admissions, um, the, the recruiting committee. Um, so um, I was asked to do that. It is you know, something that was incredibly important to me um, to contribute. It has always been something that's incredibly important to me through my career to, um, to, to be an advocate, to be a worker in the area of increasing diversity. Um, but I think that, and even at, um, even on the board at Cornell, um, I worked you know, to to represent um, minority students, 
and also uh, we really worked hard to increase the number of minority alums who were involved in Cornell activities. So that has been my passion throughout my career. Um, I've mentored, I have, um, um, I, you know, I've been involved forever. I think the thing, um, you know, a couple of things, and I've had a, you know, a number of recent um, inquiries from, from mentees mostly about their being asked to take a lead, leadership role in the area of increasing diversity or in the area of, of uh, working on inclusiveness in the organizations or the companies that they work for. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, a couple of things. First of all, um, you can't do it alone. I mean, the company itself has to, has to um, engage us. It can't be a handoff to, all right, we're gonna let the, the following, you know, minority people with people of color you know, committee and um, the leadership, the, the chairman, CEO, the top of the company, the top of the organization has to engage. And in the case of Cornell, um, the chairman of the board of Cornell, um, you know, said to me, I'd like you to lead this initiative. And, but he was very clear that I should talk to him about what we were doing and, and anything that I needed from him. I think the second thing is, you know, as a law firm partner, I was also I was expected to bill clients and bill hours. And um, I think there has to be some understanding that this takes, this is time. Um, time that I could be doing my, my, you know, my working with my client. Um, for all of these individuals, for people who get involved in this area, you know, if it's important to the organization or the company, I firmly believe it should be rewarded. Um, right. um, yeah. Because it's, you know, there's, an, you know, this is because this is taking time away from whatever it was you were hired to do, which might not have included uh, leading a diversity initiative. That's great advice. That's great advice. What about uh, how they should, people of color, uh, professionals of color, engage with other professionals of color within their organization? What sort of important uh, guidelines, rules, for want of a better term, should they follow? Um, I, I, I don't know that there should be rules or guidelines. I, I think it's very, very important as the highest ranking woman um, at, at Con Edison and uh, one of the highest ranking um, African-Americans at Con Edison, um, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to um, officers of color and to employees. Um, I always used to joke, I would arrive in the office around seven o'clock in the morning and go to the cafeteria to get coffee. And um, invariably, you know, probably you know, once or twice a month, somebody would come up to me and say, I would really like to talk to you about my career. And I would say, of course, you know, feel free to. And it would, it sometimes would be even, you know, well, I, I don't know if I want to be seen going into or out of your office. I said, well, I'm here at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm here till pretty late at night. So if you don't feel like coming during the middle of the day, you know, or if you want to have a coffee outside, I'm happy to do that. But um, I think it is important, as I mentioned before, feedback and people in other parts of the organization will have different feedback, different comments about what's going on. Um, if you're new to an organization, befriending, um, people of color to get a sense of the culture, to get a sense of, of, of what's going on and what's important. Um, uh, you know, so I, I think it's, it's invaluable and, um, and it's a two way street. You are getting information, you are helping, but you're at the same time, you are also um, able to uh, help others um, in the organization. So I've always spent, um, when I was at the law firm, I used to have what we called Las Vegas nights. What happens here stays here. And I would invite um, associates of color to my house um, where we would sit down and we would have dinner. And I would say, I was a partner. I would say, you can ask me any question you want mm. um, about the law firm. And one of the things that, that, you know, we, that I understood was that sometimes the lines of communications to um, the minority uh, um, uh, attorneys was not the same. So yeah. you know, to have to have somebody say, "Here, you know, that partner you don't want to work for. This partner is actually terrific and will be very um, supportive." You know, those kinds of uh, internal information, um, the information flow, um, is really important. So mm -hmm. I, my reaction is to get information from wherever you can and where you feel, feel comfortable. And that, by the way, doesn't mean cutting yourself off, obviously, from from white colleagues because. Um, there are, you know, there are many, 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 and many organ in, in the organization who also want to be helpful, who also um, want to uh, to advance the, the the goals of the organization. Yeah, I think that's a very important piece of this. Is that um, you know whether or not you are a person of color, it is important that you engage 
well with people of color um, and, uh, and with everyone else in the organization. Because to your point, that's how you build a culture, number one. And um, I think you could only benefit from hearing and knowing what different perspectives are. Um, to your point again, the information flow might be different in different parts of the organization. So, so duly noted. Um, uh, just, just one yeah. point on that. Uh, my mentors, my primary mentors throughout my career were white men because there weren't a lot of folks that looked like me. Um, so, um, um, you know, that was, that was something that, that oftentimes they sought me out, but they gave me opportunities to advance that, um, that I otherwise would not have had. Mm -hmm. So to the extent uh, anyone in the audience here is interested in, in board membership at some point, we, we open this talking about board membership, the lack of diversity, but, but just thinking as young professionals and this ability to lead an organization from a board seat, what are some of the important things that, that they should be thinking about now at this stage of their career, if ultimately they do want to sit? Um, on a board, whether it's that of a traded, uh, you know, a publicly traded company or, or, or not? Well, I think, you know, assuming that, that you're, you're in law school or business school, so you're going to learn the fundamentals of how organizations work, how companies work. Um, but one of the things that's kind of interesting is when you're actually on a board. Um, I have been on boards and not-for-profit boards um, all my career, uh, you know, a number of different ones. And in and, 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 and New York Urban League, I was on the Scenic Hudson Board. I was on the Cornell University Board for um, 11 years. Um, I've always sought out um, being on boards, and, and I said mostly not-for-profit boards because I did have a, you know, a, a, a career otherwise. Um, in and these were voluntary, often, you know, these were voluntary positions, um, um, but you learn board dynamics, you learn um, what's important, you learn how, you watch a chair, a good chair, and you watch how they um, manage the board. Um, you watch a good CEO and how that person manages the board. I was fortunate at Con Edison that the corporate secretary uh, reported to me, and I spent a lot of time in front of the, before and in front of Con Ed board at board meetings, et cetera. Um, I think having a familiarity with um, boards, operations and board activities and how they work is really, really important. So to the extent that once you get your career um, going and, um, and the, you feel comfortable that you can have spare time to be on a board, pick, a, pick an organization that you have an interest in. I, you know, the Scenic Hudson Board, which is responsible for um, you know, environmental issues around the Hudson River. I had no expertise in that area. I was uh, curious about environmental um, issues and how they, uh, how, how an organization advocated. Um, it was a terrific board and I learned a whole lot just from, um, from, you know, from that board, the New York Urban League, you know, clearly a, a board that is responsible for providing services to, uh, to uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, communities in, in New York City. So um, you learn a lot from a board, but you also more, I think most importantly, you learn how boards work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we just talked a little bit about, you know, really um, engaging across the organization um, in different ways and, and making sure that you didn't silo yourself. You spoke to lots of different people, get, get their different perspective. And one thing that did strike me, uh, Liz, when we were preparing for this is that you did that quite seamlessly. And I think it probably really shaped your perspective and helped you to see around corners for want of a better term, uh, so that you were able to anticipate issues perhaps or likely impacts of decisions. So I'm interested in finding out from you if there was ever a time uh, in your time at Con Ed where you and your CEO were probably at odds or had a very different view of a decision um, that, that needed to be made. And how did you bring the, this perspective that you actually you know, got from your various conversations or interactions or engagements across the, the, the company, how did you sort of bring that to bear to perhaps maybe bring him over to your, your view of things or to just help help him avoid the pitfalls um, that your perspective helped you to anticipate? You know, one of the things I learned in, in, in law firm world is if you tell a client um, no, they find another law firm. 
Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, that can't happen in an in in-house counsel, although I suppose you could get fired if you're the general counsel. Right. Or anything. So um, one of the things that I really worked with my entire team on was not being the department of no. Uh, <laughs> we were the department of here's the risk. We were the department of let us figure out how to help you get to that a goal that you might have, um, but, but what, what we were not the department making business decisions. Um, and the chairman CEO is ultimately responsible for making the bus business decisions. I can tell him what the risks are. I can tell him the best way that I think he can achieve his, uh, his objective. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, oh, you know, I used to tell my folks, um, unless it's, it's criminal, uh, the business <laughs> operations people, and if it is, I would talk to our chief ethics and compliance officer um, but the business operations, um, you know, it, our job is to assist and to um, understand what the business needs are and to assist the, the company in achieving those goals. So that's how I dealt with my chairman and CEO. And again, I, it, oftentimes it wouldn't just be me, it would be the entire executive leadership team, you know, with both chairman and CEOs that I worked for, they were very interested in getting the feedback from the entire team as to, you know, what they were thinking, whether this was the right thing to do. Um, uh, so, so it was, it's not, you know, if you pick the right company and the right organization and they have an integrity and they're transparent and they're open, um, you don't, I, I don't, I don't, I can't recall, um, any time where it was, um, you know, you know, a heated argument or discussion or confrontation around, um, a particular decision. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're very fortunate. Um, we are sort of coming to the point of the, the conversation where I know I want to open it up to students. But before we kind of get there, I, you know, we talked a little bit about this before. We were in a very sort of interesting time in our history as a world, as, as a, you know, um, you know, we have all this different phenomena that's shaping our future. You, we talked about the environmental concerns. We know about the anti-racism movement. COVID-19 itself is, is shaping uh, what, what sort of becomes of us. Um, and so I would ask for a number, three. What three character traits, and maybe you already mentioned these, do you think it is most important for our future business and legal leaders who are here today um, to develop so that they actually can um, thrive whatever the future holds, um, whatever those organizations will look like uh, in the future. I think, I, think, I think you have to understand the consequences of decisions. Um, you know, hopefully you are in an ethical organization, hopefully you're in an organization with integrity, um, but looking at the consequences of decisions, you know, 25 years ago, you know, you, you could do things and, and it might um, be really terrible for the environment, but people didn't think about it. Um, um, and and you know, had we thought about it um, 25 or 30, 50 years ago, we might have, uh, we probably would have made decisions differently for the future of this country, of this uh, of this world. So I think um, that is is critical. Thinking through the consequences of decisions, uh, it's a tough world out there right now, as, as you mentioned, for a lot of different reasons. And one of the things I think we also have to keep track of is, is um, uh, joy. <laughs> um, how do we uh, enjoy our lives? Um, how do we ensure that there's culture? And I say culture, I'm talking about um, art, um, uh, entertainment theater, um, um, you know, the things, family, um, the things that make us uh, happy. Um, so I think keeping, a, and, and, and organizations have opportunities for joy as well. And how do we bring that, especially in a time where we can't meet in person. I mean, some of my closest friends in life are people that I met when I was working. Um, it's a little harder to, to make those kinds of, uh, um, of relationships um, when you can't sit down with somebody, you know, over a cup of coffee in the cafeteria. So yes. I think that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the second thing. And then, and then the third thing I would say is I've always been um, excited about um, learning, um, being intellectually curious. And I think organizations should be learning and should be intellectually curious. And that maybe goes along with the consequences of actions, but it's also you know, what's coming down the line? You know, a Con Edison is looking at renewables. A Con Edison is looking 
you know, it's the fifth largest uh, solar producer in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it's looking at the future of electric cars. It's looking at the future of how do we make energy more efficient? How can we have better efficiency? We cannot, you know, customers have to have affordable um, energy. Uh, what's it going to look like? What are our homes and houses and offices going to look like? Um, so I think that intellectual curiosity and that, um, you know, constantly learning um, and seeking, and I always saw, I talk about feedback a lot and seeking feedback I think is really critical. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Liz. I, um, this has been great. And I, I, I wish I had some sort of like you know, thing that was reading, you know, recording our words so that everybody could see all the, the very good hints and, and rules to follow as they go ahead. But I, I am really grateful uh, for the conversation. Um, I'm looking into the chat room now and I see that there is at least um, a couple of questions. I will, I will, I will ask this to you now. Um, this question says, can you talk, uh, Ms. Moore, a little more about New York's Local Law 97? and what legal questions interest you most about this law. And, and, and the student says, for those who may not know, Local No 97 establishes annual carbon emission limits for buildings and the city will issue fines uh, in, beginning in 2024. Um, and these fines could be huge, like millions of dollars. Um, and carbon emissions are often calculated using aggregated energy consumption provided by companies like Con Ed. So this is you back in your Con Ed. Um, <laughs> any thoughts on this law and, and the legal questions that come up? And you know, the, the, the company were, is, um, um, uh, is law abiding. So um, to the extent that a law is passed and requires compliance, um, the company will comply. Um, you know, the company is a, provides an essential service. It is not the policymaker. The policymakers are government officials, public officers. So, um, um, you know, obviously we, you know, the company had, you know, the opportunity, continues to have the opportunity to discuss the law and to discuss the implementation of the law. But at the end of the day, um, um, this is what uh, has been Put in place, and um, you know the company has always moved aggressively to reduce carbon emissions. So um, it will continue to to do so. Okay, I, I hope uh, I hope our student is happy with that answer. Uh, here's another one for you, Liz. Um, some students express varying degrees of imposter syndrome in their interactions and situations. Could you offer some advice on how they can best deal? That is that is hard. Um, I can tell you I have had imposter syndrome, um, um, and part of it is I think sometimes when people assume that you can't do what you do, um, um, and that is you know that's been you know through most of, most of my career. Um, I've had people assume that I was not capable of being general counsel of Con Edison. I had people assume that I could not be counsel to the governor. I had clients who assumed that I could not provide whatever legal uh, services. So that part of it, um, uh, I think you, you, I, I've really, and the advice I get, that you I've come to the conclusion that people you know, aren't as good as they think they are, yeah. which means that I'm better than I think I am. Yep. Um, and and, and, and um, uh, if you are prepared, if you know the subject area, if you are um, you know, uh, good at what you do, um, you, you deserve to be there. You belong there. I, you know, I, I often say to women, particularly women, will often say to me, you know, I'm lucky. And I say, you're not lucky, you're good. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I, you know, I don't consider myself, I consider myself fortunate in my career. I've had a great career. I've worked with great people. I've worked in great organizations, but I don't consider myself lucky. I worked really, really hard to accomplish what I've accomplished. Um, and, uh, and I worked really, really hard in the roles that I've had during my career. Um, it's, a, you know, so, so I am, you know, I am fortunate. I am happy that I've had the opportunities that I've had, but I'm not lucky. Yeah, I'm with you there, Liz. I, I agree with you. And for what it's worth to everyone listening, um, many people who experience imposter syndrome are actually the people who have been working the hardest who have been you know doing way more than everyone else to to prove um, that you deserve it so you do deserve it uh, you do deserve to be where you are um, and don't let anybody talk you out of that 
And the other thing I would say, you know, I, I mentioned before getting feedback, get feedback from your yeah. peers, get feedback mm -hmm. from, from, from others, you know, be open to that because I think you will find that um, you're doing great. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So it's 1.32 and I think we were supposed to end this two minutes ago, Liz. Um, I could talk to you forever, but um, again, thank you so much for your wonderful advice. Uh, congrats again on, on this transition uh, that you are in, this, this phase, of, this wonderful phase. And, um, you know, I would encourage all of you uh, in our audience, if you have additional questions and so on, please reach out to Mary or to me or to Professor Katz. We're all here to support you uh, on your journey. And we thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it.